I have a question. What does it mean to be desperate? What does it mean to be desperate? If you've lived in America your whole life, I don't think you really know. Unless a doctor has come to you and said, you don't have much time to live, or you have a serious cancer, or you have uh, a terminal leukemia. Now you're desperate. But most of us, have you ever really been desperate? People around the world are desperate all the time, just for food. The dictionary defines desperation as nearly hopeless, critical, extreme urgency, a last resort. A great example of desperate prayer is in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. We're not going to turn there. Read it later. It's Hannah, Prophet Samuel's wife, I mean Pro Prophet Samuel's mother, and she is praying to have a child. Great story. What I do, though, what I do want to do is I want to pray a desperate prayer of King David, Psalm 55. We don't re really exactly know at what point in his life he was praying it this, but he's desperate for God to intervene, intervene in his life and life of Israel against the wickedness that's come against him. Psalm 55, verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Give heed to me and answer me. I am relentless in my complaint and am surely distracted. I'm distracted because of the voice of the enemy, because of the pressure of the wicked. For they bring down trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, and I would fly away to Montana, <laughs> Utah, and be at rest. Behold, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness of Arizona. I would hasten to my place of refuge from the stormy wind and tempest. You know, I read this this last week. I wasn't really planning on using it this morning. But I tell you, that seems like the cry of my heart for revival. Wickedness is all around us. David was, King David was desperate for God to come against the wickedness that was coming up against him. My question for each of us this morning is, are we desperate? Are we desperate for God to move? And it's a troubling question because most of us have never been desperate. It's easy to talk about desperation, but if you've never experienced it, But if we're not desperate, we should be. Our culture has radically changed the last 30 years. I'm 62 years old. You have, those of you who are under 30, you have no idea what America was like when I was your age. When I was a young boy, if you hadn't gotten gas on Saturday, you didn't get gas. Because there was no gas station open on Sunday. I mean none. No groceries, everything was closed. Our culture, I mean, think how our culture has changed the last 25, 30 years. And, the, and this, is what I, this is what should make us desperate. The rate of change is going to accelerate. And it's going to accelerate because my mother's generation and my generation, her child, that generation's children's generation, are dying off. And we're taking our traditional values and our votes with us. Our Judaic Christian heritage is basically what has protected our re religious freedom. You say, oh, it's the Constitution. Now, wait a minute. If you don't have people interpreting the Constitution who understand our Judeo-Christian heritage, how many of you know their interpretation of the Constitution is going to change a little bit? I mean, look, open your eyes. We used to speak about a cultural war. To me, 
It appears to be over. We have lost. I believe that our culture has crossed an invisible line. Now, but God, of course, but I'm just, if I just look at it, our colleges are cranking out humanists. Even our Christian colleges are cranking out something that's less than, well, anyway. Christianity's been marginalized in America. It's been slowly, it's been slowly squeezed more and more out of every aspect of public life. I'm reading a book right now. I'm not going to tell you the name of it because I don't know if I could recommend it. <laughs> but because there's some things in there that I go, come on, dude. But anyway, the book is written to prepare Christians for persecution in America. And it's selling like hotcakes, from what I understand. Now, all the while, Christianity is being marginalized in America. The American church has generally been asleep. It's been impotent. There are, I mean, there have been men and women and ministries and churches who have tried to sound the alarm, but few are listening. Most of us Christians are too busy with the pursuit of you fill in the blank. So here we are today fasting and praying in a 21-day period and then having a sacred assembly for three days because we want God to move. And it isn't we want God, we need God to move. But I'm, I'm wondering, am I desperate? I have a little bit of an idea, idea of what desperation is because I've had a doctor tell me, you have oral cancer and it's in your head. you got a tumor in your head. But are we desperate? Do we really understand the times in which we live? Because they're desperate. My son got engaged last night. All right, well, I'll... <laughs> guys, you know, it's, you're, you're clapping, thank you, but you know what? <laughs> I have mixed emotions. But anyway. I told Grace last night that she is the answer. <laughs> to Mary's and my thousands and thousands of prayers. We've been, I prayed for his wife, didn't know who she was, and, and now I'm looking at her. She's something else. But you see, I tell you that, not to get a clap, but I tell you that because we start talking last night, you know, the first thing I go, well, how long are you gonna, until you're going to have some kids? <laughs> Dad, we just got engaged. I, I know, but let, let's, let's start thinking about it. <laughs> Nine months, is that good? <laughs> Nine months into it. And I, and I started thinking about our grandchildren, their children. What is America going to be like? That makes me desperate. What I want to do first, boy, that was an introduction way longer than I thought. But um, I want to, first of all, let's, let's, what, are, what, are, what are the two main sources, at least what I believe are the two main sources of the desperation that the church is beginning to feel in America? Number one, the source is the powerlessness in the church. Let's just read a few scriptures. Romans 15, for I will, this is Paul speaking, for I will, assume, I will presume to speak, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, result, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem round about as far as that weird name, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. In the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, from Jerusalem, for as you know, far away as I can think, this city in Asia, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. Paul speaking to the Corinthians. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. 1 Thessalonians 1.5. 
For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. 1 Corinthians 4, starting verse 19. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills it, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. In other words, Paul, the way he measured a church, the way he, um, what's the other word for measured? Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Evaluated a church, a ministry, was by how much power the Holy Spirit was evident among them. Boy, that's convicting. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. It's you and me. What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? Surpassing greatness of his power. In other words, power to blow us away, power to amaze us, power to get us on our knees and glorify God. These are in accordance with the work of his strength, of his might. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12. To this end we also pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Now you, you and I read these scriptures, and I think we can all make an, ob an obvious observation, and that is that there is a real disconnect between the New Testament church and the American church. What the New Testament church and they're experiencing, and what we're experiencing in the American church, there's a disconnect. Where are the healings, the miracles, the signs and wonders? The power. Now, many Christians explain this disconnect. They explain it by saying that the power of God, the healings, miracles, that kind of thing, died out with the apostles. We call that cessationalism. They're cessationalists. That word's hard for a stutter, so just... Give me a break. So they think, they believe and preach that this supernatural type of power, signs and wonders and so forth, healings, the miraculous died out with the apostles. So in effect, it's not our fault. The fact that God's power isn't here, it's not our fault. There's no apostles here. That's got to be wrong. I read the Bible, that has to be wrong. To me, that's like a cop-out. That's an excuse for our failure to seek God. Now, people who believe that, can you see if you believe that there's no power in the church because the power died off with the apostles, maybe that's going a little bit too far about what they say. I'm talking about really miraculous power. If you believe that's not in the church, You can accept a church that has no power. You can accept a church that isn't doing that much. Because things are just going to get worse and worse, and then we're going to be beamed up. But if you've done any traveling around this world, if you've gone to other countries, especially third world countries, where people don't have a lot, and they know about desperation, you will experience the miraculous power of God in their midst, doing all kinds of things. Last night, I, this isn't in my notes, I, I told the congregation last night, I think the Lord wants me to, um, to tell you a story, 1990-something, um, when the Iron Curtain fell in uh, Russia, we, we, we took a team over there. And uh, don't want to belabor this, but uh, we were in a, a city, Rostov, on the Don, and a uh, lot of things. It was a crazy trip. But it culminated in a crusade. And we, the biggest, and Rostov's a big city, and the biggest auditorium was the Communist Party's thing. Huge thing. 
I don't know how many thousands of people it, it, it held. I, I, I can't even remember anymore, but I know there was a lot of people in there, lots of people. And so we did a skit, we sang songs, and, and then, you know, I came out and I preached Jesus crucified. I just told them about Jesus. And then I told them, who wants to accept Jesus? Come on down here. 90 to 95% of everyone in that just came down. <laughs> I said, I looked at the transfer and said, you know, I got to do that again. They misunderstood me. Um, <laughs> something's wrong here. So I explained it again and I said, raise your hand. They all raised their hood. They, hood. they all raised their hand. And then I looked out and uh, hanging in that auditorium, it was a huge auditorium that kind of went up like this. And in the top rafters of this place, there was a cloud. Um, it was like, a, you know, um, a smoke machine that we have in here sometimes, but it was up there, and there was these sparkling things, just sparkling away. <laughs> That's the glory of God, I think. <laughs> and I, you know, and, and a, a lot of other, a lot of other people saw it. It was just, it wasn't just me. We went and preached at this other place, and the people, the power of God fell, and the people had me cornered. I was in a corner, and they were just, they were. <laughs> And they just wanted me to touch them because God was doing miraculous stuff. I was in a corner. I mean, they pressed me into a corner. God bless you. God heal you. I thought, gosh, stop. <laughs> but how many of you know is I, I had nothing to do with that. I was in the right place at the right time. When the Bible talks about when Paul talks about power, of course, he's using the Greek word dunamis. Most of you have heard it, and it's where we get our English word dynamite. It's incredible power. Where's the power in the American church when people come through those doors, they are convicted of sin, fall on their face before God? Nothing less than that is going to satisfy me. I need, want, desire, and praying for, hoping for, believing for that kind of power in the church. But for it to happen, we have to be desperate for God to move. Desperate to see our friends and neighbors come to Jesus. Desperate to see our loved ones come to Jesus. Desperate to see our sons and daughters who have fallen away from God come back. The prodigals filling the church. I know that many of you have the same prayer of Paul. Philippians 3.10, where he says, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. I want to know Jesus better and the power of his resurrection. So the first source of our desperation, I think, should be the powerlessness in the church. The second source of our desperation is this, I think, I believe. And it's the lack of fear of the Lord in the church. Acts 9.31. So the church throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria, enjoyed peace. Being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord, comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Now this is important. So the church was increasing for two reasons. The work of the Holy Spirit, the power and work of the Holy Spirit, and the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is important for God's church, and the church is God's idea. For the church to function the way it's supposed to function there should be an obvious fear of God in our midst. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning. There's a book out there on fearing the Lord. It's on a special day for $8. $8. I'm not trying to hawk this thing. I'm just saying, if you want, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Since fearing the Lord is an obvious important element of the church to be successful in its mission, let's quickly define it. What is it? Well, first, what it is not. It is not some kind of super respect for God. Whenever I read someone's definition of fearing the Lord, I want to th throw up. We talked about Jesus is our friend. He is our friend. He's there for you but he's also the creator, the almighty God of the universe. He would just go like this and you go, 
it would just explode into a nothingness. You'd be a dust. You'd, it wouldn't exist. This is the God that said, let there be light, and the whole universe went boom. The dictionary defines fear, and it's important to understand when the translators to translate the Bible, they try their best to use the American word that matches the Greek and Hebrew word. So what does fear mean? Fear is a strong emotion caused by anticipation of awareness of danger, anxious concern, reason for alarm. The Greek word phobia, the Hebrew word pehad, both mean to be afraid of, to have terror or dread. To be afraid of, to have terror or dread. And if God would have wanted the writers of his word to use some other word, they would have used it. Matthew 10, 28 says this. This is Jesus. He said, Do not fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him, God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Why? Why should, why should we have this terror and dread about God? Because there are consequences for disobeying him. There are consequences for saying, I want nothing to do with you. There are consequences for saying, not only do I not believe in you, but I'm going to do just the opposite. I'm going to fight against you. I define fearing the Lord like this. An understanding that there are consequences for disobedience, blessings for obedience and faithfulness. If you read through the Old Testament, one of the things you'll see, one of the most important theological concepts in the Old Testament is fearing God. When the Israelites feared God, they did okay. They didn't fear God, not so good. When you don't fear God, when you don't fear God, you don't pursue God. And you don't pursue God, you don't pursue holiness and sanctification. The result is increased rationalization and compromise. People stop going to church, they stop reading their Bibles. It, it, it's just kind of a slippery slope downward. The lack of fearing the Lord has greatly weakened the American church. It concerns me greatly that so many come to church and they're living together. Rationalize premarital sex, excuse pornography, justify divorce, do not tithe, lie daily, and don't seem to have, well, don't seem to take God serious at all. And I want you to know that I am appalled at my own lack of fear sometimes in my own life. That I take God so casually. Especially for me. who've studied this so much. I, of all people, it appalls me. So, I mean, I'm not just pointing the finger. So here, so we have quickly defined what I believe are the two major reasons or sources why we should be desperate in the church of Jesus Christ. So what is the remedy? What do we do? How do we change the status quo? How does revival come? Well, first, the last time I preached, we talked about the fact that revival starts with us. There's a battle inside yours and my heart for who's going to sit on the throne of our life in every aspect of it. It's always a battle of surrender. It also requires an, ev an evaluation of priorities. Okay, so, and so how do we change the status quo, though, practically, in our lives in the church. Three priorities, and I'm gonna go through them quickly and then we're gonna go home. Number one, pursue God's word and preach Jesus crucified. I didn't make this two points, I made it one, and you'll see why in a minute. Jesus said, his words were spirit and life, John 6, 63. And Jesus said to his disciples, teach my words to others and teach them to obey me. Now, can I have the, uh, the last slide up again, please? I use that word pursue for a reason. 
When you pursue something, you follow after it. You try to gain proficiency. You chase after it. When you pursue something, it becomes a priority in your life. Many people pursue golf. Why, I will never understand. <laughs> oh, okay, getting back. Ah, uh, 18 times they do that. People pursue sports, recreation, sex, partying, relationships. If we want revival, we have to pursue God. Amen. Read the Bible, memorize the Bible, read it to our children. Get the word in. If you get enough Bible in your children, they'll know things are wrong even before someone tells them. You want to get the Word of God in your children so it creates the right kind of appetite for what they want in their life. Read the Bible to your children, grandchildren. Fill their hearts with God's Word. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart so, lot, so that I will not sin against you. Psalm 119.105, and many of you know this, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When we pursue God's word, we pursue obedience, right? Because if you pursue understanding what God says and knowing it, then you're going to pursue obedience. And ultimately, that means you're going to pursue sanctification. I like the word sanctification because it's a process. We're called to be holy, but I, when, when I hear someone that says you've been called to be holy, I say, well, boy, I'm going to fail. Just ask my wife, I'm going to, I'm going to fail. But sanctification, though, Hebrews 12, 14 says us, without sanctification, without pursuing holiness, we will not experience God. Look for, up for yourself, Hebrews 12, 14. When we pursue God's word, obedience, we're going to change. Our priorities are going to change. We are going to become the salt of the earth. And in this process of pursuing God, and finding out what he wants in different areas of our life, submitting to it, and saying, Lord, change me. I'm going to be obedient to you here. I'm going to, obedi I'm going to, be I'm going to obey you in this situation. It doesn't, I don't want to, but I'm, I'm going to because I'm seeking after you. In this process, Paul tells us to preach Jesus crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 13 says this. When I came to you, now, Paul is, is talking to the Corinthians. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. How interesting. Boy, that doesn't sound like the American church's idea of how to evangelize. We've come up with everything but. I mean, why talk about the cross? Why talk about that horrible thing? Putting nails in your hands and it's one of the most horrible ways to die that there is. Why not focus on something else? Uh, talk about Jesus' great teachings, his compassion, how he understands where you're coming from. How he just wants you to be successful and fulfilled in your life. Because... The cross is where everything changed. It's what Jesus did on that cross that changed the world forever. It's why it is a symbol of Christianity. That cross is a lot of things. Surrender, but ultimately it says, Jesus died for me. Jesus died for us. And you see, you can't talk about this cross without talking about sin. Because that's why Jesus was nailed to the cross. For your sin. For my sin. Jesus took our punishment upon himself. Making it possible for you and I to know God and have eternal life. But here's the problem in America. If you were to ask the average person out there, unbeliever, what are these Christians all about? What do they believe? 
You know what you're going to hear most often? Well, they don't really like homosexual marriage. They're against that. They don't like homos homosexuals. They're against a lot of things. They're not, um, they're very intolerant to other people's beliefs. Um, they're, against, they're against a woman's right to choose, on and on. They're against a lot of stuff. I doubt you hear very many people say, what Christians are all about is Jesus Christ dying for their sins on the cross so that they can know God and have eternal life. Simple message. And I, I was thinking about this this afternoon. We Christians have failed to communicate that. In large part. When Paul came to Corinth, it's just one Jew. And uh, we have this writing, and uh, it's the only uh, description we, we have of Paul. We're not 100% sure this was the, the, the description, but it says he's a short guy with a hooked nose, and he, he had, he, he, supposedly, he was bull-legged, he's bald. God bless him, but anyway. <laughs> and uh, so he was unimpressive to look at, and other places in Scripture, we, we get the impression that he wasn't that good of a speaker. But he knew what he was talking about. Yet the city of Corinth had an awakening. Billy Graham was an interesting person. You ever, uh, there's all kinds of auto, auto, biographies of his life. And, and they all talk about, everyone that I've ever read, a period in his life where he, you know, he was just trying to do what his professors, Bible teachers told him to do. He was getting theological and nothing was happening. So then he just started to preach Jesus crucified. Simple, simple messages. I come from a Lutheran background, and I still remember, especially early on, I would hear that, you know, Billy Graham never, his, his, his messages don't really say much. They don't have much depth. They're not blah, 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 blah. But people got saved. Meanwhile, never mind. <laughs> So the first priority is we have to pursue God, pursue obedience, which is sanctification, by which no one will experience, and we, and we have to preach Jesus crucified. We have to always think, that what this person needs next to me is Jesus, the crucified. They need Jesus. They need a Savior. They don't need theology. They need the Savior. We can, get all, we, can get, we can talk about all, you know, how many angels can stand on the head of a pin, all that kind of stuff. Later! If God's good, why has bad happened? You know, sir, I don't have an answer to all those, but I know one thing. You need a Savior. Jesus died for you. He loves you. He went on a cross for you so that you can know God, and you wouldn't have to fear death anymore. You can have eternal life. The second priority we have to have is prayer. In the church, our success is always determined by prayer. Prayer opens the doors of heaven, ushers in the presence of God. It is the, rec it is the, recogni the recognition that we can't do it. We're having a prayer meeting tonight. Why are we doing that? Because we recognize we want God to move, and it isn't going to happen because we work hard. Hand out a bunch of flyers. Put doorknobs everywhere. Spend all kinds of money on billboards. Put advertisements on TV. Make movies. If God's Spirit isn't there validating what we're saying. If you want supernatural power working in your life, then not praying is not an option. To change circumstances, counter godless pressure, we must understand the battle is first won on our knees. Most of you know that. Because Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And how many times have you heard that? How many times have I heard it? And then James said, you do not have because you do not ask. Those nine, those nine words changed my life. You do not have because you do not ask. Finally, the third priority has got to be in our life in the church. Number three, get involved in ministry. 
get off your doofer. And, and by the way, I use that word, and I found it. I made it up. It's nowhere in the dictionary. I had Sylvia look it up, right, Sylvia? In the international slang, everything. Doofer. Do something for Jesus. In James 2, James said, faith without works is dead. I'm not talking about salvation. He wasn't talking about salvation. He was talking about, you're not going to be alive. You're going to be alive in your faith. You want to radiate Jesus? Do something. Get involved in ministry. Share the love of Jesus. We have almost 100 ministries in this church. We minister to five to 6,000 young people every single week. Good heavens, you have an opportunity here. There's people that need you in the hospitals. I mean, I mean, everywhere you can imagine. Do something for Jesus. The simple truth is, if you want to have a personal revival, you've got to get out and preach Jesus crucified. When God opens the door for you, you have to open the, open the boca and say something. I believe that. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Yes, we need to get into God's word. Yes, we need to pray. We, need, we all need to get involved doing something. Doing ministry, serving others, changes you. It energizes you. It makes your Christianity come alive. You'll get the opportunity to preach Jesus to someone. It is truly more blessed to give than to receive. Guys, I got saved at 22. I overdosed on some drugs. My mother hates when I talk about this. But anyway, I did. Not proud of that part of my life. St stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid me. But anyway, I was desperate. I needed, I reached out for, for a rope. God was there. But <clears throat> what really changed my life is when I started working in the church. I started working in youth ministry. And I tried to, you know, tell people about Jesus. Mark got saved. He did the same thing. It changed our life. Let me have the band up here. What about you, friends? Faith without works is dead. Now, I'm not saying you have to do something here at our church. I mean, big world out there. But do something. There's a lot of great organizations out there that you can be involved in and work for Jesus, but do something. You want to have a personal revival? Do something. Turn off the TV and do something. One of the things that I have fasted these last three weeks is I've turned off the TV. I used to watch, you know, start with O'Reilly, then go to Meg and Kelly, and then finish up the night with Hannity. <laughs> and it hit me one night, I'm sitting there going, they're saying the same thing over and over and over again. I can probably watch one of these shows once a week and that's all I need. So I've shut that off and I've been reading books and learning, learning something. Well, don't clap for me, good heavens. Don't clap for me that I finally, oh, I see what you're saying. I finally got a clue. All right. Yay, our pastor, finally. Thank you, praise Jesus. Let's all stand.